So, as I said, this morning we'll be covering verses 7 through 19 in Hebrews chapter 13. And I've titled today's message, Some Final Instructions. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but um, to be honest with you, in the beginning when I first was introduced to this letter, I, I, I received a lot of great nuggets of truth. And I, this letter really spoke to me. But by the time I got to the end here, the 13th chapter, um, there seemed to be a lot there. And it seemed to be all disjointed. And, and you know, things seemed to be kind of just all over the place. And I kind of just skimmed through it, through most of that chapter. As maybe, again, maybe some of you have as well. Or maybe, you know, you also done that with some books. You just, you know, you get through the whole thing and then you just want to skim through the end. And, but either way, um, if that's you, maybe you've noticed it too, that this last part here seems, seems somewhat disjointed. In much of the same way that maybe those who read a, maybe a military briefing today might find it, you know, might not just really get it. In a military briefing, those of you who have been in the military or are in the military, a commanding officer informs the troops about the battle plan. Okay, now again, let me, before I say this, there's more to it, there's more details, but this is just a general, uh, you know, idea here, but he instructs, informs the troops about the battle plan, provides tactical information, makes clarification, and gives personal instruction. Any troop or uh, soldiers receiving such a briefing will certainly see these instructions as coherent, but for a lot of other people, that haven't been in those kind of situations or haven't received such a briefing, it would, they would probably find it perplexing, somewhat confusing. This is why these concluding commands in Hebrews chapter 13 might seem disconnected to maybe some of you. In these verses that we're going to be covering today, it's basically a commanding officer's last order of business with his troops. It was, it is a word they needed to hear. And it's a word that us Christians, us believers still need to hear today. And so there's two things that we're going to be covering today, two lessons and the first one we'll be covering in the first part of our reading, and it's this. To avoid being carried away by false teaching, imitate the faith of godly leaders. And hold firmly, hold on tightly to the centrality of Jesus Christ. His sacrificial death and the promise of heaven and secondly, the other lesson we'll be learning at the other half of our reading today is the importance, my friends, the importance of praying for your pastors, your leaders, those near, those far, those that are in, serving in ministries, the importance of praying for them. So before we get into the first part of our reading, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us powerfully this morning. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this time of worship, that time of worship that you allowed us to have. Lord, thank you that you have everyone here, and they're all safe. And, and now, Lord, whatever is on their minds, whatever distractions or um, that might be in the way of hearing what you have to say, I pray that they just will be removed, Lord. 
And that right now, at this time, be everyone dedicate this time to you, Lord. That you give everyone here a word of wisdom, a word of insight, Lord, uh, something that they can take back with them and, and just really grow from it, Lord. Thank you for being so good and so wonderful and for being our God. So now fill this room with your spirit, Lord. We just sit at your feet now and hear from you. Thank you. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 13. We're going to be beginning in verse 7. And the word of God says, Remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you as you carefully observe the outcome of their lives Imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't be led astray by various kinds of strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be established by grace and not by food regulations, since those who observe them have not benefited. We have an altar from which Those who worship at the tabernacle do not have a right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the most holy place by the high priest is a sin offering, as a sin offering, are burned. Are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing his disgrace. For we do not have an enduring, for we do not have an enduring city here. Instead, we seek the one to come. Uh, this letter of Hebrews is It's just filled with all kinds of moral exhortations. And well, as we just read this section here, verses 7 through 14, is no different. Starting in verse 7, the author exhorts the believer to remember their leaders. Specifically, he wants them to remember those who have spoken God's word. Now, in the immediate context of the letter, this refers to those who taught them the gospel. If we broaden it out, this refers to those who taught them the whole Bible. Now, I find it interesting that instead of encouraging his readers to honor or respect or be courteous and kind to their leaders, the author is urging them to remember those leaders. Why do you think that's so? Well, it's possible that he could be referring to certain leaders who had already been martyred, who had already been killed for their faith when this letter was written. So by telling them to remember, he wants them to look back and consider how much of an impact their lives had made and to imitate that faith. Now, Paul does the same thing in 2 Timothy chapter 3. There he calls on Timothy to avoid a wicked example and urges a young pastor to imitate Paul himself instead. And then he goes on to encourage him, encourage that young pastor, Timothy, to uh, imitate his conduct, aim in life, his faith, his patience, love, and sufferings. Friends, church, many of you know that if, if you've been walking with the Lord for a long period of, period of time or 
even if you're a new believer, throughout your Christian life, the Lord will put, or maybe He's again already put several leaders in your path. Some of them have been really good. Some of them have been really bad. Some of them have been good examples and some of them not so good examples. But let me tell you this. The great ones are those who walk the talk. Who walk the talk by living out what they're preaching. These are men, and yes, women too in, in their ministries who will faithfully testify to Christ, who faithfully you know, are, are, are witnessing, you know, giving their witness with their words, and yes, even their actions. Theirs, my friends, theirs is the faith to imitate. The faith that clings to Christ and to Christian doctrine. And that brings God into every aspect of their life. Now, another thing to keep in mind as we read this is that it isn't saying here that you must imitate their calling. Don't confuse the two. No. God may actually have a different calling for your life. It says there to imitate their faith. Now, but here's the point. Now, even though we're not all called to the same forms of service, we are all called to a life of faith. We're all called to a life of faith. The next verse, verse 8, we're told who the object of their leaders' faith was and who, and who the object of our faith is. Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You get that? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, right now, this very moment, and forever. He will be the same way for all of eternity. Now, the unchanging nature which theologians call immutability. The immutability of Jesus Christ is something scripture makes abundantly clear. For example, we hear something similar about God in the Old Testament. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, it says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you see, this means that even though Jesus is in heaven right now, in his resurrected bodily form, and is sitting at the right hand of God, he is the same. He's the same in his wrath and his love and mercy and compassion and tenderness as he was here on earth. Now, it's also important to mention that Jesus' immutable nature also applies even when our outward circumstances, even when the world around you seems to be falling apart, even when those circumstances are constantly changing. You see, because of his disposition toward us, because it's fixed for eternity, we don't have to worry about him increasing or decreasing in his saving power. And even though every faithful leader we look to will eventually pass away, they will eventually die, Jesus will still be alive. He will still be alive and will always be faithful 
to his children. He will always be faithful to you. Therefore, you can rest assured. You can rest in the absolute confidence that he will never change. Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Those are the words of our Lord. Now, since we know, we know Jesus doesn't change, then logically, it would also mean that Christianity, if you understand what I mean, if you're following me, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if both are true, which they are, then Christians, as Christians, we should be able to detect strange teachings and not be led astray by them, right? Well, this is what the author brings up next in verse 9. And there he uses two noteworthy words to describe the kind of teachings we should avoid. Various and strange. Now, when it comes to the theology of the gospel... Variation isn't something to be embraced. It's something to be avoided. If anyone brings to you another type of gospel, have nothing to do with it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is clear. Avoid anything else, any variation of it. See, after all, there's only one faith one gospel, and one Savior. Additionally, we should be able to recognize a teaching as strange when it runs contrary to the sound doctrine of Scripture. In other words, if it contradicts anything that we have here already. The Word of God. If it contradicts the Word of God, have nothing to do with it. Strange teaching. Recognize it. If you don't know your Bible, well, it's a good idea to start knowing it now. Because as we get closer and closer to the Lord's return, there are going to be a lot of people out there. A lot of people are going to confuse you and going to want to mess with your mind. You're going to want to mess with the scriptures. They're going to want to make the gospel of Jesus more woke, more appealing. But the truth is, the gospel, it's going to sting because it confronts sin. It confronts the sin of every single person. They either will avoid it or it's going to make them go on their knees straight to the cross and ask for forgiveness. That's what the gospel does. So although these various kinds of strange teachings aren't specifically mentioned, the following verses does suggest that he, has, he does have certain Old Testament teachings in mind. When it came to food, the law regulated what a Jew, what a Jew could or couldn't eat. These were also meant to distinguish the Israelites as God's holy people. And so whatever they are, whatever, you know, it may have been, these teachings were contradicting the theological unity of the gospel message. And so the readers are urged to avoid them. That Entertaining false teachings will lead them astray. The author also reminds us here, uh, here in verse 9, that establishing our hearts by grace 
not through external food regulations, is a good and wonderful thing. Friends, grace, like the Earth's water system, operates on gravity, the spiritual gravity of grace. You see, just as the waters of, the, of Niagara roll over the falls and plunge down to make a river below, and just as that river flows down to the even lower ranges, lower ranges of its course, then glides still more low-lying areas where it brings life and growth, so it is with God's grace. Grace is gravity carries to it the lowly in heart, where it brings life and blessing. Grace goes to the humble. This is the spiritual law behind Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, which James chapter 4, verse 6 quotes, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The unbowed soul, that person that refuses to bow down, refuses to humble themselves because of the pride of their heart, that person standing proudly before God receives no benefit from God's falling grace. Sure, it may descend upon him or her, but it doesn't penetrate, and it just drips away like rain from a statue. But the soul lying before God is immersed. That person who is just completely humble, broken, open to what the Lord wants to do is, is completely exposed. That soul is immersed and even swims in a sea of grace. So while there's always more grace, it's reserved for the lowly and the humble. Legalisms, even little ones such as dietary rules, impede. They impede grace. And so the point is this. It doesn't matter how concerned you are with dietary rules, whether they're kosher or vegetarian or... Atkins or whatever, all, all those different kind of new diets that are out there. It doesn't matter if you're born again, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, if you surrender to him, you live by grace. And your hearts are strengthened by grace. External matters cannot strengthen or save you. We're saved, my friends. We're saved by the mercy of God, which has been demonstrated in the new covenant. So in verses 10 to 14, the, the author once again stops to reinforce one of his main points. Christ is the mediator of a new and better covenant enacted on a new and better promises. In verse 10, the writer compares the new covenant, the new covenant altar, the cross of Christ, with the old covenant altar. He points again back to the tabernacle rather, uh, than, rather than, than the temple, as he often does, to inform his Jewish readers that those who serve at the old altar have no right to eat at the new one. But believers, born-again believers, do have a right to eat at this new and better altar. Why? Because we enjoy the fellowship we now have with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Once again, the author is demonstrating that Jesus is a far better high priest for his food and altar surpasses the food and altar of the old covenant. 
the author then brings up the bodies of animals that were sacrificed under the Old Covenant. Although we don't often think about what became of those carcasses, we know from Scripture that they were taken outside the city, they were dumped, and they were burned. Otherwise, if they would have kept it there, it would have defiled the city. Those carcasses weren't allowed to be in the city or in the, anywhere near the temple, even if they had been burned within its walls. Like these old covenant sacrifices, Jesus, our Savior, also suffered outside the gate. This parallel is most explicitly seen in John chapter 19, verses 17 through 20, as Jesus carries his cross to Golgotha, which is outside the gates of Jerusalem. And we also know from the Gospels that he was buried outside the gates. This really is truly an amazing correlation. But what makes Jesus' suffering outside the gates far superior to that of the Old Testament animals is that his suffering is what his suffer suffering accomplishes. Jesus suffers outside the gates so that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. Do you get that? Do you know what that means? His blood, Jesus' blood actually makes believers holy. If you're a believer, his blood makes you holy. This astonishing reality once again reveals that the Old Covenant sin offerings pointed to the better New Covenant offering of Jesus Christ's blood. This reality also leads the author to draw implications for his people in verse 13. Since Jesus suffered outside the camp, his people... Those of us who follow him, followers of Christ, Christians, we must identify with him there. Thus, following Jesus means joining him outside the camp. The original readers of this letter, you see, had been tempted to find their identity in Judaism and the Old Covenant. Instead of bearing his disgrace for the sake of Christ, they were looking for safety and security in something other than Jesus. And there are a lot of people today that are doing the same thing. And a lot of even Christians are doing the same thing too with religion. Finding, they're trying to find their safety and security in something else. So you see, the author is telling us now that if we follow Christ, we must go outside the camp. We must go out there, even if it means we have to suffer there. Verse 14 tells us the why and the how believers can suffer for the sake of Christ. Because we anticipate an everlasting city. Now let me also mention this before I talk about that everlasting city. A lot of churches out there that are living right now are in a bubble. Now it's hard for those that are going there to see that they may be in a bubble, but if your Christian life has been nothing but safety and security and you've, you've never been persecuted or maybe not even persecuted, if you've never been called names because you're a Christian, because you've never given, been, you've been given bad looks or you've been mocked or been made fun of because you're a Christian, 
yeah, you've been going outside the gate. Believe it or not, there are a lot of Christians out there, a lot of believers who are just living in this bubble. They don't want to venture outside the gates. But as we see here, we're told that if we're going to identify with Christ, we must go out there. Yes, even if it means suffering. And we can suffer again for the sake of Christ because we anticipate something better, something eternal, something glorious. We anticipate an everlasting city. Church, our hope isn't in a faded or corrupted city that man built or that man has or that comes from man. It's in the enduring city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem. We're waiting for a glorious and eternal city that is yet to come. And because of that, we can endure persecution outside the camp with Jesus. You can endure those mockings. You can endure people making fun of you. You can endure when you're given a hard time because you are a believer, because you're a Christian. Because he was there. Jesus was outside the camp. He's been there. He went through it. And so the best way, again, to summarize verses 7 through 14 is this way. Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday and today and forever, becomes our constant meal, our food, our drink, our life. And we will receive from him grace upon grace upon grace. And because he is outside the camp... He will always be accessible. In fact, he is with you, in you, and coming to you. This understanding that he nourishes us and is acceptable to us will help us to keep on in this course, in this marathon, in this Christian life. It will help us to keep going no matter how hard it gets. Now, in the final section that we'll be covering today, the author continues on with some final exhortations and and a genuine prayer. So let's read. Let's pick up in verse 15. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Therefore, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice, a praise, that is, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. Obey your leaders and submit to them, since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account So that they can do this with joy and not with grief. For that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us. For we are convinced that we have a clear conscience. Wanting to conduct ourselves honorably in everything. And I urge you all the more to pray that I may be restored to you very soon. Outside of God's word, the Bible here, one of the most profound sentences ever written is the answer to the first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is the chief end of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Or as John John Piper has modified it, Man's chief end is to glorify God by enjoying Him forever. In other words, the only way that you can truly glorify God 
is by enjoying him. Are you enjoying God? Or is he a burden to you? Ask yourself that question. Hopefully you'll be able to answer. You have an, have an honest answer for yourself. If you're a joyless, grim, bummed out Christian, gritting your teeth as you endure to the end, you aren't exactly a great advertisement for how good God is. So if you want to fulfill the chief purpose for which God created you, you must live to glorify God by enjoying Him forever so that our joy in God spills into cat continual praise of God. There's a, a question similar to this that people have <coughs> been trying to answer since the beginning of time. What is the purpose of life? And I believe this question that the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks is that question, what is the chief end of man? All of us have thought that at one point or another. What is the purpose of life? I thought about it. I read several books as a young man trying to figure that out. What is my purpose? What is the reason I'm here right now? When I became a Christian, gave, myself, gave my life to the Lord, it all made sense. That question was immediately answered. Now, don't get me wrong, there were a lot of questions that weren't answered, but that was one question that was immediately answered. And it gave me so much peace, and that was this. Again, it's again similar to this. To glorify God. The purpose of your life is to glorify God. And later on, it wasn't until later on that I figured out the other part was to enjoy Him forever. Not enjoy Him right now when things are good, but enjoy Him even when things are bad. You must live to glorify God by enjoying Him forever so that your joy in God spills over into continual praise of God. But the Bible links this first great commandment to love God with our total being with the second commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves. So to move to a monastery where we just cut ourselves off from others and live in perpetual praise of God, it, it falls short of what actually pleases him. You can't do that. That's not what he wants from you. He doesn't want you to go off and be a desert hermit, just you and your Bible and, and God. No. Now we see in verses 15 and 16 that he wants us to offer our lives as continual sacrifices of praise to him. But also not to neglect doing good and sharing. In other words, we glorify God both by a life that continually spills over in praise toward God and by practical good deeds. Thus, our, our text here makes the point that through Christ, we should offer God sacrifices of praise and good deeds. Which what? They please him. Now, let me, let me break this down even further. In case, you know, uh, again, I'm not kind of just not making any sense here. In verses 15 and 16, the writer named two spiritual sacrifices, two of the spiritual sacrifices that we offer as Christians. Two of them. Now, the word spiritual here means spiritual in character, to be used by the Spirit for spiritual purposes. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 is a good example. 
Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifice, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so, you, so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So the first spiritual sacrifice is continual praise to God. The words of praise from our lips when we're singing songs of worship in the beginning of church service or whether you're singing praises to God in your car, at home, wherever it may be, those spiritual praises are coming from your heart. They're coming from your heart. And it's like having beautiful fruit laid on the altar. I know in the Psalms it describes, it's like the worship to him is like a beautiful smell. It's like the burning incense. And it comes to the Lord, God's nostrils, and it's a pleasing smell. You ever have that good smelling incense? That good smelling, you know, we have fresheners here and, you know, that you just enjoy, you just love, you just want to keep spraying it. And maybe, you know, you're a guy, has your, you have your favorite cologne you know, and, and you just love spraying it, but maybe nobody else likes it, but you like it, you know. Well, for God, these continual words that you sing to him. There, he loves them. So, this is why I say, you know, when we're here, whether we're, we're worshiping someone's up here, or, you know, singing, or, or whether we have the YouTube videos, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed to, to sing these songs to him. You know, none of us here care that you have, whether you have a good voice or a bad voice. You're singing these praises to God and he enjoys them so much. And he loves to hear from his children. Those of you who have kids, you know, when you have kids that are singing to you, you know, they're not the best singers in the world, but, you know, you still enjoy them. You still enjoy them singing. It's just beautiful. It's great. That's how, God, that's how God hears you when you're singing to him. So don't be ashamed. I'm just saying, go ahead and sing. To him, you have a lovely singing voice. The second spiritual sacrifice is good works of sharing. This would certainly include the hospitality mentioned here in verse 2 of this chapter, as well as the ministry to prisoners mentioned in verse 3. Of this chapter, and I covered that last week. Doing good can cover a multitude of ministries, sharing food with the needy, transporting people to and from church or other places, sharing of your finances, maybe, perhaps just being a helpful neighbor. Now, in verse 17, the writer once again gives a call for Christians to listen to and receive the teaching of those who have been commissioned, who have been ordained to teach. They're not instructed to do so because the leaders are smarter, but because God knows what his people need. And what do his people need? What do his children need? They need good teachers. For this reason, the church rightly sets apart and commissions those who are called and given this gift. But we also reminded, however, that those of us that do teach, those of us that have that responsibility, we're going to be held to a higher accountability. I keep in mind, though, that the author here isn't simply instructing us to receive the words of our leaders, 
but to obey and submit to them as well. Here again, as I mentioned uh, last week, we have to be careful. We have to use discernment. You know, there are wolves in sheep's clothing out there that are going to try to deceive you or going to try to mess with you or going to try to confuse you. You got to be wise. You got to use discernment. You got to know the word. And you got to really pay attention to the character of that, of that leader. But whoever that leader is, if you're going to serve in that church, you're going to be in that church, you have to submit to them. When you're no longer there and you want to go away, then you no longer have to. Now, when it comes to the word that's being taught, we're told to submit to it. That is, to, that is, uh, to what the teacher teaches. Again, this may not necessarily be to the teacher. God has determined that his word be conveyed through the human voice. Teachers are therefore just human instruments that are set forth to teach God's divine word. I'm just an instrument. Pastor Isaac is just an instrument. Those pastors that you had, old pastors you had at one time, are just instruments. This instruction isn't some obscure statement of cultic authority. Insofar as leaders teach in accordance with God's word, they are to be obeyed and their teaching is to be taken seriously. Meaning if... I'm not making a show of this. If I'm not just fluffing this up, if I am teaching you, if not just me, but if anybody is actually teaching you the word of God, listen. Listen to what it's saying. Listen to that instruction. That teaching is to be taken seriously. Why is that? They keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. I take the teaching of God's word seriously because I know that I will be held accountable for teaching this word to all of you, to God. And it's a scary thought. It's a scary thought knowing that everything I say, I'm saying today, I've said in the past, and will say in the future, I will be held accountable. But I'm at peace because I know that my heart is in this. And I know Isaac's heart is in this as well when he teaches, when he prepares his message. So, yeah, you know, we hold ourselves to a high standard and we hold our, we, we, you know, we, we know what that means. So I don't take this lightly. This isn't a joke to me. This is seriously. This is serious. Teaching God's word is everything. It's everything to me because I know what it means. So again, let me repeat. Here are the, some of the reasons to submit to spiritual authority. Here are some of the reasons to submit to spiritual authority. Uh, authority. Number one, God-appointed leaders are fulfilling the high charge of watching over their congregation's souls. Number two, such leaders must answer to God as the judgment at the judgment seat for their work. And number three, believers' obedience will bring joy instead of pain and will work to preserve their soul's advantage. Slavish, blind obedience isn't called for here, but a, re but a respectful, submissive spirit is. Christians are to be discerning in their hearing of God's word. They must never accept something as true because a preacher or leader says it. If 
you doubt what I say, go out and study it yourself. Go out and read and find, you know, go in depth with what I just covered here in these verses. Then come to me and we can discuss it. We can talk about it. And if I'm wrong, and I will admit that I'm wrong. I'm not standing up here as a, that I know it all. But, again, let's discuss it. Let's talk about it. If you don't want to come here anymore after that, then I understand. But if you want to continue to be here, then you still have to continue to have that submissive heart, that submissive spirit. That's what the Lord wants to see you have. At the same time, they are to be eager to obey and to submit to authority. Such ought to be one's first impulse when their leader and the people are right with God. The last two verses echo the closing address Paul gives in the book of Acts when he says, I always strive to have a clear conscience. Every church leader, this includes me, this includes Pastor Isaac, should pray and strive for this very thing. Our goal should, should be to have a clear conscience as we faithfully lead Christ's church. We want to honor the Lord in everything that we say, in everything that we do, in everything that we think. Like the author we don't want to bring any reproach on the gospel. This is why we need your prayers. This is why we need the prayers of our people, of our fellow believer. After saying this, we see how much of a letter this book really is. See, letters naturally list the kind of intimate language that requires the first person pronoun. Up until this point, we haven't seen much of this first person because of the letter's formal nature. But as the author begins to close, the tone of the writing changes and the pronouns shift accordingly. So here, the author urges his readers rather earnestly, to pray for him so that he might be restored to them sooner. This line here really humanizes the author now by making us feel the anguish that he feels for not being with his church, but he, how he just really wants to be there. The peerless Victorian preacher of London told his vast congregation as he concluded his sermon, or this is C.H. Spurgeon. He, he told his congregation on May 27th, 1855, my people, shall I ever lose your prayers? Will ye ever cease your supplications? Will ye then ever cease to pray? I fear ye have not uttered so many prayers this morning as ye should have done. I fear there not has been so much earnest devotion as there may have been poured forth. For my own part, I have not felt the wondrous power I sometimes experience. So see, church, if we truly desire power in our lives and in our churches, we must pray. Likewise, if you desire my or Pastor Isaacs, or whoever pastor is teaching up here, they're preaching to be more spirit-filled, you must pray for us. Keep us in prayer. How different do you think today's church would be if the majority of its people prayed for its pastor and its leadership? I honestly really believe that, if the, that the Holy Spirit would move powerfully we'd see more believers come to the grips, more believers come to grips with the deeper issues of life. The leadership vacuum would evapor evaporate and there would be more conversions. So will we commit ourselves to pray 
for our church pastors, our local pastors, those pastors that are truly teaching the Word of God and their leaders and their elders, especially those who teach on, in Sunday school or maybe lead in other important ministries. When you pray, when you're praying, I suggest three headings for your prayers. Devotional, praying for your leaders, not just, yeah, leaders here in the church, but all leaders, city, state, nationwide, or uh, national government. Pray for those in your school and your jobs. They may come to know Jesus. Devotional, leadership, school, or jobs. A single commitment could ensure ongoing vitality for our churches. I have no doubt about it. It's an indisputable fact. Pastors are a group of one of the most abused and hurting segments of modern society. If you desire, you feel like you're called to be a pastor, yeah, you're going to know what I mean. Admittedly, sometimes the misery is self-inflicted due to laziness or ineptitude. But more often it comes from the factors that I just mentioned. And this particular angst of the clergy is superseded by an even greater tragedy. The mournful act that tens of thousands of churches right now, at this very moment, they're not doing well. Many are just dangerously gassed out. They're tired. They're, they just want to give up. Some are already dead and don't even know it. And the skeletal remains of some are on the side of the road. How many churches do you know have, been, have just failed? Have just fallen apart, apart because of infighting, because of division? And now they're no longer a church. So what's the answer? The writer hasn't given us all of it, but he has given us two huge pillars of support. It's the last these two things I'm going to mention. Two huge pillars of support. Obedience. We're to obey our leaders. As verse 17 said, obey your leaders and submit to them, since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account, so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Slavish. Mm unthinking obedience no rather the will to obey to be respectful to be supportive to be a cheerful team player and the other pillar of support prayer this obedience is to be oiled by prayer again verses 18 and 19 say pray for us for we are convinced that we have a clear conscience wanting to conduct ourselves honorably in everything. And I urge you all the more to pray that I may be restored to you very soon. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word you've given us this morning. Thank you for the grace that you've given us, the love that you gave us that we didn't deserve. But that we now have because, that we, and we now have because of your son, Jesus Christ. Pray, Lord, that all those who are hurting, all those who are just going through a difficult time, I pray that you will comfort them be with them, Lord, whether it's, whether it's a, whether they're hurting emotionally, spiritually, physically, Lord. May they find comfort in you. And may they remember the joy of being your child. 
Something greater is awaiting them, Lord. Remind them of that. That right now, that they're feeling the persecution, the, the hatred, the, the scorning from others because of their faith. That again, they're they're just identifying. Remind them they're identifying with your Son, Jesus Christ. You're so good and so wonderful. Thank you. If you've never surrender your life to Jesus and right now you feel that pull you feel that call I want to invite you to the cross where you can lay all your sins before him and ask Jesus to forgive you of all your sins if you're ready to do that I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and pray this Lord Jesus I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.